people are taught racism. It is not something that's innately given to everyone. I think that uh, white people should apologize for 400 years of slavery. So I wrote this sign because I don't know what it is to be a, a black person in America. Hi, uh, my name is Adrian, and uh, I believe that the police brutality is real, even more real now that we see it, and it's been happening for hundreds of years. I think that uh, white people should apologize for 400 years of slavery, and the police brutality right now is the same thing I believe that was happening 400 years ago. It's just in a different type of form. And for me as a white person, I am responsible to put an end to this because I am part of the problem as well if I don't come and support uh, black people. So I pray that we could all come together as one because we are all children of God. We all have the same values. We are all made in the image of God. And nobody is above. I believe that police has the duty to protect the people and serve the community rather than have a conflict and kill our innocent lives for no reason. So how do you think that we can trample racism here in America? I, I wish I would have a perfect answer for that, but I don't. But I believe that if we were make more awareness of the brutality that's happening, and if we come together all as a family, together for the same values, I believe that defunding the police not giving six billion dollars for something that obviously is not working and if it will be working maybe giving more money to the lower income communities on educating the police officers on how to properly protect its citizens and build the trust between the community and the police officers and that has to come with the police officers accepting their fault. Nobody is perfect, but we cannot stand all together for something that's not right. And just because we are a team, that does not mean that we all are perfect. We all have our flaws, and those people that have flaws do not belong to be on the streets. And all police officers should stand with the community rather than stand with the team, because they became police officers to serve, to protect us, not to protect their own police department. Do you think with all the protesting and all the marching that going on here in America, do you think that it's sending a message to the police and to the system and to the ones that are in high places? I believe it is sending a message and uh, we are proving it that the marching is real and the police officers realize that this cannot just be another case, another person that just died. The message is simple. We make mistakes, they made the mistake, they should be arrested just as a normal citizen. And if the marches don't show, then I don't know what else because there's thousands, I've been protesting almost as much as I can, being on the street and showing my support for what I think is justice. If we would have been a white guy, I would have been the same thing. If we would have been a Chinese guy, I would have been there as well but it happens way too often to our black brothers. In America, breeding black in America, right? Yes. Yes, so why? Why, why the sign? Uh, I write this sign because I work at a hospital. Okay. And uh, I believe when uh, COVID happened, people did not believe in the virus. And it's the same thing as people didn't believe that black people were getting killed left and right by police brutality. So when people think that it's hard for them to wear a mask, then I cannot even imagine having a police officer just having a stigma all the time on you because 
you don't feel safe all the time because a police officer, I believe they're always there to to come after our black brothers. So I wrote this sign because I don't know what it is to be a, a black person in America. And I don't know how secure or safe they feel. But all I know that I can stand with them and walk with them and do my duty and put my mask on to protect them, to protect myself and fight together this this cancer that is poisoning for 400 years and we need to put a little stop to it. Thank you so much, sir. Hi, my name's Samantha, I'm 18 and I live in the suburbs so I have a definitely a different perspective of this entire experience. So obviously where I live there's not as much diversity and cultural immersion so when all of this happened and people have brought awareness to the George Floyd killing it brought a lot of people out of being blinded by their own privilege and really put things into the perspective of how our inaction and complacency has been killing people so for my, me personally I took this as a wake-up call because I'm guilty of being complacent and complicit with everything that's going on and I think for a lot of people like non-white by POC um, yeah this has been something that has caused a lot of people to wake up and I've been in the city and I've been popping out for the past two weeks and I've brought people and everyone's decided that this is something that everyone has to participate in and it's our responsibility to do so and to speak out, of, uh, out uh, against it because what's going on right now and in terms of all of in terms of education specifically in white suburbia people are taught racism it is not something that's innately given to everyone and there is a huge deficit of learning about westernized white eurocentric ideals and learning about other people who are black that have been pushed out of the curricula. So I've been working personally in my community to help fix that. And then as well, I've been coming here, bringing my friends, participating in protests and speaking up about it because this is something that has been perpetuated for hundreds of years and people just take this as something that is a passing thing. I mean, with Eric Gardner, he, was, he also said, I can't breathe. But now is a time where people will not stop. Like it just started seeking justice for George Floyd's killers. Now it's abolish the police. And like, we won't stop. And I think that a lot of people, especially white people, have realized that we have to be a part of this and unify together in order for anything to pass. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just my perspective on it. What do you think about parents who teaching their children yeah. about okay. racism? Yeah. You as a young person, what would be your message sending to the elder okay. or to the parents who want to teach their children about racism when me and you trying to heal it? Right, okay. So I know, so a lot of my friends have been dealing with this issue in terms of talking about their parents and elders about racism. And a lot of the times having these conversations can be extremely confrontational and result in arguments and no, one getting, and no one's getting to some sort of middle ground. So what I found in terms of connecting with elders is relaying your personal experience and saying how I was like this and I thought this but X, Y, and Z and being very objective with your goals. Because some people want to have conversations of pointing out what someone's doing is wrong. Some people want to enlighten them about how, like the problems that are going on. Some people, especially biracial people, like with parents or a parent who's white, that they can't necessarily connect with this black person and just kind of giving them per their perspective. So my advice is being very clear with what you want to get out of the conversation so you can deliver it correctly, but having these difficult conversations and putting pressure on your parents or even to have the most constructive conversation is doing your educating yourself and doing the groundwork before. So going into the conversations, you have your facts, you have experiences, so they don't 
say that this is all based on emotion because a lot of people try to gaslight you in that way. But if you do your facts, have your facts, do your research, do your due diligence, be very objective in what you want to accomplish out of the conversation, and ask them questions too. That's also very important because we're all trying to gain perspective. No one's a perfect ally. But in order for you to achieve, to strive to be even better, you have to push boundaries and not be okay with just settling for like less. So how would you change an 18 year old from changing our way from being a racist person? Okay, so that's a very good question because I think that unlearning is one of the hardest things to do. Because this, this, this whole entire movement is about learning and unlearning. It's about learning experiences, again, re having resources. Because there are so many resources, but people don't utilize them. Like, these books and everything else have existed for forever. And no one knows about them. I'm going to be straight up. Like, Toni Morrison has been around. When was the first time I read her work? This year. Like, that's not okay. So, I mean... Unlearning is about having the conversations, knowing, having accountability. A lot of white people don't want to be wrong and are very defensive in acknowledging their complacency. And they don't want to admit that they've been, exactly, they don't want to admit that they've been wrong. So in order for you to move to that next step, you have to acknowledge the fact like, yes, I've not been being a good ally. I have been racist. There's a lot, there's a lot of covert and overt racism and everyone has been a part of it. So as, as, if you acknowledge that, put in the effort to actually utilize these resources, have these conversations, that's how you can unlearn and move on and be a better ally. But it's a lot of self-accountability and a lot of acknowledgement that you've been wrong. And that's what a lot of people struggle with too. Okay. In my opinion, I believe that the policing system is so deeply ingrained in racism. I mean, the whole purpose of why police, the police force were started, yeah, it was for slave patrol. So going off that basis and the core foundational aspects of police are so deeply ingrained in racism, you cannot fix it unless you completely dismantle it and rebuild it. There is no way because I, I spoke to my community police department and I've brought attention to all these incentives and policies that they should implement and they're like, we're already doing that. If you're already doing shit like that and it's not working, what does that say about everywhere else where there's like overt police brutality and people are getting killed? What does that speak about the system? If you're already saying that there are things that are in place that exist but they're not even working, how does that make sense? Yeah, the the whole reason policing this policing system was working was started was because there were slaves that were tr that tried to escape. And, and their reform, and then, their re police reform was to change the Can you the guys go behind our Can you, yeah. To police. Yeah. yeah, and also you that have to understand in terms of like the that, racial... When people oh, say right. police reform, like that was one of the... Reforms. And then if you want to get into more history, so there was... So do you know what indentured white... In, so there were slaves and then there were white indentured servants were basically slaves. But they wanted to make a more racial divide because now all of these white indentured servants were revolting. They were like, okay, we need a slave patrol specifically for black people so the white indentured servants didn't feel like subjugated and felt like they, there needed to be a specific divide. That's why there was a slave patrol just for black people, not for these white indentured servants. And then as soon as that completely populated, spread across the country, built upon it with that same exact foundational core incentive. And then they, they haven't changed the system for literally over 400 years. And then they've passed policies to help combat that. But obviously, as we can see, that's not working. Yeah. 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 You want to say something? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. Yes. Two minutes, guys, please. Okay. Two minutes. All right. I also think that the education aspect is super important because when you defund, when we say defund the police, we mean like redirect those funds into communities, communities of color, into public education. And I think something very specific that's super fucked up that is con contributing to everything is that public schools which is you know where a lot of marginalized communities and black and brown communities they go to public schools um, they're funded through property taxes so it depends on the neighborhood that the school is in so it has nothing to do with government funding which is super fucked up it should be government exactly it should be government funding so all that money that's going to the police should be completely more than split in half I don't think they need any money they truly don't need six whole billion dollars um, 6.8 whole just, billion dollars. I don't know unnecessary. Why I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I just I think it's really important to put 
those funds, redirect those funds into school, especially and communities of color. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Yeah. Conservative leaning, it's a conservative leaning, fake legislation. So they write all these policies and they secretly give it to congressmen. And then congressmen take these things that, and they're getting paid off by Alec to do it. And they write their own legislation and propose it to Congress to get it passed. And that is how Walmart, that's how, um, what is it? Stand your ground. That's how stand your ground policy came to place is because which is how Trayvon Martin died. And George Zimmerman is not incarcerated due to the stand your ground policy that was placed basically by- What was the stand your ground policy? Stand your ground policy is you have the right to shoot someone and kill someone if you feel like they are coming at you and you could like stand your ground basically. And there was no sort of like probable cause why Trayvon Martin got shot. As you know the story, I don't know. He was literally walking in his like neighborhood, had a snapple on him and like Skittles. And George Zimmerman like went at him and he was the aggressor. And it ends up in a wrestling match, obviously, because this like 17 year old kid was getting attacked by a guy. And George, Zimmer George Zimmerman shot him by Sander. And like he wasn't incarcerated by Sander Brown, which is ridiculous. So, do you have, or uh, do you know any history about Christopher Columbus? Well, yeah, we were t 1492, Christopher Columbus <laughs> on the ocean blue, of course. We were t Johnny Appleseed. We, what? He he was convinced until his dying breath that he was in India. Like he just would not admit to anybody that it wasn't India. Johnny yeah. Appleseed or Christopher Columbus? Christopher, Christopher Columbus. Columbus. Yeah, that was one of the first things that I learned was that Christopher Columbus discovered America, which is absolutely unequivocally untrue. He did not discover America, but he yeah, discovered it for Spain. He discovered it for Spain, and then oh my God, I didn't learn about like the brutality of colonization until I took an AP class. And that's also a huge problem.